We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning, church. Wow, this is a, an amazing group of people. Hey, my name is Mike Miller. Um, I'm one of the pastors here at ACC, and I'm super excited about today's message. Uh, but before we really get into it, I want to say welcome to everybody that is in this room, watching online or watching from the lounge. Uh, today, I believe that uh, God is going to speak to your hearts, um, uh, something that is good for 2023 especially uh, but before we really get into the message, you know, Pastor John mentioned we, have, we had 146 kids upstairs last week. I believe we're going to break that this week, uh, just looking at this room, and we got another service that's usually really full too. Uh, but you know our kids' ministry, they're doing an incredible job, and, um, and, and I'm going to tell you why. If you go up there, or just whenever you see the kids out and about down here later on, if you ask them anything about what they learned and all that, they get really excited about telling you what they learned up there. They get excited about sharing the love of Jesus. And I have some proof for you. My daughter, I gave her a little phone, one of my old phones to play with not too long ago, and she was, she was playing with it, and I found this recording that she made, and so I'm going to show it to you. Um, let's start with that. How about that? All right, take, take, take a look at this video. Welcome to ACC. This is Maddie, Michael Miller's daughter. This is my friend Sadie, Hi. my friend Lily, and we're here to tell you about God. Ow! <laughs> Your face. Okay, yeah. we're gonna edit that part out. Ow. Okay. We um we want you to come to our ACC church because it's really good and stop bleeding. And it has Kid Venture Week. It has Kid Venture Week where your kids can have a nighttime off and you can finally have some like grocery time. You moms, the dads can go like a little. Oh, hunting. it also has party in the park. Watch it has park. party in the parking lot um, on Sundays where all your kids can play and then don't bother her. And you meet new friends. You meet at new party friends. Park. You meet new friends. She, you meet new friends. That's how I got new these friends. new friends. Yes. Woo! So she, she's going to be our new videographer, video editor here at ACC. I'm going to hire her. So as you all know, uh, many of you know me enough to know that I love like response type of things, right? I love when you talk back to me. Not like in a bad way. Uh, hold your tongue if you have something bad to say. I love it, but, but here's, the, here's what I need you to know is I need some extra volume today for me to be able to hear you because I have an ear infection in both sides uh, and my, they said my ear drums are like practically on, the, just barely hanging on. They're, they're gonna rupture maybe. So uh, if you wanna rupture them, that's fine. You can get loud enough to do that. I, I dare you. Uh, but hey, uh, one more thing that I wanna point out is all of the volunteers in the room that are not, obviously not serving right now because you're in here, make sure that you see your leaders today uh, to grab one of these cards. It's a very important, special day that we have planned for you guys that I need you guys to know about uh, coming up in just a couple of weeks. It's not the VIP party that yet, but um, go get that because we need to make sure that you are there because uh, we have some things that we want to share with everybody. So see your leaders today. And also, if you want to go and you're not a volunteer. You can come too. Just uh, we'll tell you when it is and what it is. But hey, uh, I'm really excited about this message. We're talking. We're, we're going through the book of Daniel, uh, and, and, and we're going to be talking about uh, Daniel two today, King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Uh, but last week, Pastor Matt opened the series talking about how culture plays a huge part in our lives. Right? He, he had talked about how culture shifts. Uh, quickly and constantly. And when it does, it, he said this, it tries to reshape you, it preys on the young, and it tries to give you a new identity. And we've seen that when, when we were uh, talking about the book of Daniel in, in chapter 1, 
when, when, we're, when we heard about Daniel and his three friends, as we would know them as who? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Y'all remember from VeggieTales and, and all the little flannel boards and all that, or felt, whatever they call it. Um, so, you know, that wasn't their original names. That's what the culture at that time, what they tried to rename them to. So we got to see that there. But I want to give you a little bit of a recap about Daniel's life for a second. Daniel, uh, we don't see a lot of these details when you just kind of breeze through the book. Uh, you have to kind of dig to find out some of these things. Daniel was young. He was one of those up-and-coming leaders. He had that kind of leader potential. Uh, he was talented, a great student, and smart. And I've heard from some scholars that they believe that he was a decent-looking young fellow, so all the ladies were probably after him. But all that changed for him when Babylon came into town. <clears throat> the Babylonian Empire came into town three different times into Jerusalem, and they attacked Jerusalem three times. And the first time... They abducted uh, Daniel. Every time they, they went back and uh, attacked him, they took more of the Jewish people. But during the first attack, they took Daniel because they noticed he had some giftings and potential, and they sent him to serve the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, so after this happened, he was stripped from his country. He was stripped from his home. He was stripped from his culture, from his family, and he'd never see them again is what you'd see in the story. You'd ne- he, he would never see any of that again. But many scholars also believed that Daniel was, was made a eunuch, which means he couldn't have a wife, he couldn't have a kid, obviously couldn't have any fun. And so there's that. Daniel had every reason to be bitter, but instead he made the choice to trust his life and his future into the hands of God. So today we're going to be looking at the dream of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to call him Neb or Nebi or King Neb. I don't know how it's going to come out today, uh, but just bear with it because Nebuchadnezzar's along. Can you say that 10 times fast? Probably better than me. Uh, But, you know, speaking of dreams, real quick, how many of you have ever had a hard time falling asleep? I would dare to say that probably if you didn't raise your hand, you're lying. Um, (laughs) I had, I had the same thing happen to me last night. I, couldn't, I didn't go to sleep until I think it was like 3 o'clock, 3.30, something like that. Uh, but, but I have this problem where I will fall asleep for five to ten minutes sometime in the middle of the evening, and then I kind of just like, ooh, I'm awake. Or even whenever we go to bed, I'll fall asleep, and then like five or ten minutes later, I'll wake up suddenly, and I'm like, I don't know what just woke me up. And then I'll be up until 2 or 3 a.m. or later sometimes. I've even gone like, man, this is dumb. I'm going to go to the gym at like 2.45 in the morning just because I couldn't sleep. And so it's terrible when that happens, but whenever I finally do get to sleep, I've noticed whenever this happens, I always have this really action-packed dream. And I don't know why. It's always intense, and it's great. Sometimes it's, you know, oftentimes it's like hunting stuff or bows and guns and and fishing and my wife and none of them related, so don't get any assumptions. Um, (laughs) But I I know a lot of you have these nights where you have dreams also, and and some of you, you may wake up and you're like, wow, that was a weird dream, and then when you try to think about it, you're like, I don't remember, I don't remember what the dream was, I just know it was weird. My wife is one of those people, she'll be like, she'll she'll wake up and tell me she had the weirdest dream, and I'll be like, well, what was it about? And immediately, she's like, well, I don't remember. And so things happen, you know. But while some of you may have dreams and you brush it off your shoulders as, as though you're sim- it's simply like a movie playing in your mind while you're asleep, some of you may have dreams and they stick with you all day and you think about them all day and you're wondering what they meant and they may worry you a bit and, and, and maybe even it was a dream that made you happy and then all day you're going, man, I, I hope that comes true. That would, that would be so cool for that to come true. And some of you may have dreams like Nebuchadnezzar, where his dreams disturbed him so much that he couldn't sleep until when he did fall asleep because of the dreams. He couldn't sleep very well. And they disturbed him so much that he would go to great lengths to find out what the dream meant. So let's read from the book of Daniel. And and listen, if you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in the seat in front of you. Go ahead and grab that. You can take that and write your name in it and take it home. We want you to have a copy of God's Word. So that Bible is for you. So Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says, One night during the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had such disturbing dreams that he couldn't sleep. He called in his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers and astrologers, 
and he demanded that they tell him what he had dreamt, dreamed. As they stood before the king, he said, I have a dream that deeply troubles me, and I must know what it means. Let's pray real quick, and then we'll get right into the message. Father God, speak to us through King Nebuchadnezzar's dream and through our own. Speak to us things that you need us to know, Father, for our lives to be uh, passionate and, and energetically following after you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so point number one, we're going to go right to it. Point number one that I want you to remember about Daniel chapter 2, when we're talking about King Nebuchadnezzar, is that King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. King Neb has a dream. And we see from this text that King Neb was only in his second year in office, and his dreams worried him so much, and they caused him so much grief and so much anxiety that he couldn't sleep. Can any of you relate to that, where you're sitting there going, I, I, don't, I don't know why I'm so anxious. I can't sleep. I, I, I don't know where, where this came from, but now I'm tossing and turning all night. So what did he do? He picked up his phone. Let's bring him to, you know, 2000, let's just say year 2000. He picked up his phone and he called Miss Cleo. Who else would you call, right? It, who doesn't know Miss Cleo? We got anybody who does not know Miss Cleo? All right, so everybody in this room has just, except for the one, has just admitted, or a couple, um, to having insomnia. Because like 20 years ago or so, maybe, she might even still be on. I have no idea. I don't have cable anymore. But uh, Miss Cleo, you know what, just ask somebody from an older generation. They'll explain her to you. But she was popular for a while. But here's what I want you to see about King Neb. Neb, he was a king, as we talked about. He had money. He had power. He was praised and although sometimes he had, to, he had to force people to praise him, and you'll learn about more of that, uh, or you'll learn more about that in, some, in part one of the upcoming ser- uh, messages in the series, but none of that stuff would calm his troubled mind. None of it would calm his soul that was being tormented. He, he brought his troubles to bed with him, and he couldn't sleep because of it, right? So he tossed and turned. And instead of having a restful night, he had this disturbing, super strange dream, and his rank in life was no guarantee for peace. And I'll tell you, the same thing is true for us. <laughs> your rank, your position in your job, your influence on people, none of that can guarantee peace, because peace only comes from one source, that's God. I can promise you that we can all relate to this story, if not currently, like today, then at some point in your life, you will. But today, it may sound more like this for King Neb or for any one of us. It may be about your work day, right, where you're like, man, work was, work was tough today. There's that one guy that I just, ugh, he's so annoying. He follows me around. He won't leave me alone. He's, I can't get my work done when he's around. Oh, and it just gets on my last nerves. He won't give me any space. And then you get off and you go home and you're like, I just need to be away from the office. So I get, I, you get home and and you think things are going to go fine, but then it just keeps replaying in your head this conversation that you had with them, and, and, and it's just frustrating. And now you're worked up, and this could apply even at school, too, for the younger generation. Now you're all worked up, and then you're like, oh, you know what, I'm just going to go to bed. So you go to bed, and then you start thinking about the next day, and now you're tossing and turning because you're dreading going to work and having to see this person again, and, and it's just like, man, this really stinks. And then what happens? More and more thoughts start to flood your mind, Right? Thoughts and thoughts and thoughts, things that you don't want to think about. Now falling asleep becomes seemingly impossible. And, and, and because of this, you're, you're, you're having this time of, of you're, you're kind of causing yourself to be worked up into this, into this dreadful, ang- anxious-filled uh, cycle, right? And then when you finally do fall asleep, because of all of that, now your dream is probably not going to be great. Your dream is going to be terrible. There's not going to be any delicious steak or pizza, or any of the things that you love, maybe a burnt steak and a burnt pizza or something, but, you know, no flowers or anything like that, but instead, your dream is going to be confusing, maybe, concerning, and you might see yourself, here's one of those things that I've had where I'm like, I don't even know where, they, where why it happens. I tend to have a lot of war dreams, probably because I watch a lot of those kind of movies, but like, you ever have those dreams where you take a long, a long step, like you're running from something, 
and then you're like, I'm never touching the ground. I got to speed up. And so you start running faster, but your legs are moving faster, but you never really, you're sitting there going, where's, where's gravity? And you finally touch the ground, but you don't have enough traction because you barely touch it. You ever have those weird things like that? I, I, when, anytime that I run in a dream, I never really get up to speed because I'm like floating like I'm on Mars or something, or maybe the moon is more likely. But if we keep reading in this story, we, we would see that we, if you remember when we read in the first few verses, King Nebuchadnezzar called his sorcerers, he called the enchanters, the magicians, the astrologers, and he commanded them to do something, to, to, and to tell him his dream and to interpret it. Now, I want you to catch something there. What happened, he commanded them to tell him what his dream was and interpret it. He didn't go, all right, guys, so here's what my dream was. I need to know this meaning. They had to guess this dream. That, on a different note, but probably related, I'm going to speak to the wives for a minute because Mother's Day comes quicker, and then that's no fair. Wives, don't hit your husbands. So I'm going to speak on, on their behalf for a minute. We don't know what you mean half the time. When we say, are you okay, and you say, I'm fine, to us that means I'm fine. Obviously, experience, um, we learn later on, it'd take a while though, maybe like, for me, probably like nine years. I'm fine, uh, was not I'm fine. Uh, or here's a better example, when, when we ask you, hey, what do you want to eat for dinner? And you go, uh, you pick. And then we list like 12 different restaurants, and you're like, no to all of them. You just got to tell us what you want, because we can't guess it. We cannot guess it, all right? So back to King Neb, King Nebby, good old Nebby. All of these people that King Neb brought, none of them could do what he had asked them to do. He ordered them, because of this, he was so angry, he ordered these people, he called them the wise men, he ordered them to be put to death. There were hundreds of them, if not more, uh, and this included Daniel and his three friends that we mentioned earlier. And so when they heard this, this is what it says, starting in verse 17, it says that Daniel went home and told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, what had happened. He urged them to ask the God of heaven to show them his mercy by telling them the secret so they would not be executed along with the other wise men of Babylon. That night, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision, and then Daniel praised the God of heaven. And here's what I want you to learn from this, what Daniel did and what we should be doing in every area of our life, especially when we have a dream. And I'm not talking to you, whenever, whenever I say your dream, I'm talking about the dreams that you have when you fall asleep, but I'm also talking about dreams that you may have for your life, dreams that, uh, that you believe God has placed something inside of you that's just, you're itching to get that out and you want to get, you want to, get to this particular, like I, I dream to be a doctor or I dream to be a pastor or I dream this or that. I'm talking about those things as well. But the first thing that Daniel did and that I'm urging you to do is to pray first. Pray first. Prayer should be the first thing that you always do. When Daniel was faced with death, he stopped and he prayed. He encouraged his friends to do the same thing. He told them to pray. When you're faced with a tough situation, you ought to pray first. When you're tossing and turning because something is bothering you and you can't shake that feeling, Prayer is the answer. When you can't sleep because you don't want another harsh dream or difficult dream that, leave, that leaves you anxious all day the next day and tired and confused and troubled, prayer is the answer. Don't wait until, you, wait until the end to find out what's going to happen or wait till you're on the chopping block or anything like that, depending on what your situation is. Don't wait till all of that happens. Just start with prayer. That's what Daniel did. Now, you might be thinking, so that's what Daniel did about someone else's prayer, right? But, or their, their dream. But what about when it's my dream? Well, I'll tell you this. When it's your dream and you're in the shoes of King Nebuchadnezzar, you should still pray first. You should still pray first. You don't have to go call Miss Chloe because she's not going to be able to do anything for you, but you should call on the God of the impossible. Call on the creator. Call on the all-powerful, all-knowing, one and only God with a capital G. Pray first. That is the answer. Prayer. Let's continue to read. In verse 27, it says, Daniel replied, there are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. And this is what Daniel was telling King Neb, by the way. He said, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, 
and he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. Now I will tell you your dream and the visions you saw as you lay on your bed. Because Daniel prayed first, God revealed to him what he needed to know and when he needed to know it. So what you see here is Daniel's story, it's, it's, it's human inability fully met by God's almighty power. Nobody, not, not Daniel, not any of those magicians or sorcerers or anybody could tell Neb what he wanted to know. No one could do it with their own power, in their own mind, in, the, in their own strength. But Daniel knew to call on God first, and when he did that, remember what it says in Luke 1, verse 37, it says, nothing is impossible with God. And I like the way the NIV translation puts it better. It's, it actually says, for no word from God will ever fail And I'll tell you, Daniel needed to know that because he was faced with potential death if he got this wrong, if he couldn't tell Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was. Point number two today, what we learned from Daniel 2 is that Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Nebuchadnezzar's dream is a prophecy of four world kingdoms. Can I take you back to history class for a minute? Is that all right? Probably not. (laughs) I was that way in history class too. But now I'm regretting it because I'm like, man, some of these things that I could have learned back then and I have to relearn now, it would have been better to pay attention during history. Uh, But in Daniel 31 through 35, you see very quickly and easily, you, you get to read about King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So before we get to the actual history stuff, let's read it. It says, in your vision, your majesty, you saw standing before you a huge shining statue of a man. It was a frightening sight. The head of the statue was made of fine gold. Its chest and arms were silver. Its belly and thighs were bronze. Its legs were iron, and its feet were a combination of iron and baked clay. (laughs) I'd say this dream is starting out to be kind of weird, right? What would you do if you you just fell asleep finally after that long day, and all of a sudden you see these weird this weird, huge statue in your dream, and you're like, oh, that's weird. There's four different kinds of metals. I don't know. This is, it's not like the normal statue that we would see in like when you walk down in D.C., you know. This is strange and scary. But it, there's, there's something that you need to realize from this is it, that it makes it a point to, to tell you what, these, what each segment or section of this statue is made of, gold, silver, bronze, and iron, even a little bit of clay. But it says that it has a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and the feet was iron as well, and it had a little bit of clay mixed in there. If you're not catching it, the four metals are the unique features of this statue. And I'll tell you, the key to understanding what these four metals mean of this statue, it starts whenever you get to verse 38, the second half of verse 38, when Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, you are this head of gold on top of the statue. He tells them that, that represents you. And then he goes on to speak of the other three successive world kingdoms, which we'll get to that, but it's in verse 39 it says, but after your kingdom comes to an end, another kingdom inferior to yours will rise to take its place, or to take your place. After that kingdom has fallen, yet a third kingdom represented by bronze will rise to rule the world. Following that kingdom, there will be a fourth one as strong as iron, And that kingdom will smash and crush all previous empires, just as iron smashes and crushes everything it strikes. This statue is a symbolic representation of four successive world kingdoms. And Jesus calls calls them the age or the times of the Gentiles. From, From the overtaking of Judah by Babylon, that happened in 606 B.C., by the way, Israel, from that time on, Israel never had a place of world dominion again. Hence the reason why we call it the age or the, the age of the Gentiles or the times of the Gentiles. So in this vision, the first kingdom was the only one that was clearly identified, and that was the Babylonian Empire. However, if you keep reading on in the book of Daniel to, to chapter 7 and chapter 8, you would see 
the other two kingdoms that are mentioned, and, and those two kingdoms are the Medo-Persian Empire and the Greek Empire, and they're uh, the Greek Empire ruled by Alexander the Great. Now, here's a fun fact uh, that I found kind of interesting, was there was a Roman historian named Josephus, uh, which he, he, wrote, he wrote that when Alexander came to the city of Jerusalem, uh, the high priest of Jerusalem met with them, and he told him, he was like, hey, Alexander, probably call him Alex. I don't know. Yeah, we would at least, right? Hey, Alex, you know you're mentioned in the Bible. Let me show you. So he, he pulls his Bible out, or the, the Bible at the time, whatever he had, and he shows him the book of Daniel. And he showed him where he fits into the prophetic picture, prophetic being the key word. Now, Alexander the Great was so moved by this that he spared the whole city of Jerusalem. He didn't kill a single person in the city of Jerusalem. Both of these empires that we're talking about, they were still non-existent at this time, during the time that, that the, when the book of Daniel was written. Now, the fourth kingdom is, is never clearly mentioned or named in the book of Daniel. The fourth kingdom, according to most scholars, if not all, uh, the, the legs of iron, the fourth kingdom, it in the dream, it represents or it's referring to the Roman Empire, which overtook Greece, if you read history, right? So we've got four kingdoms. The Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. And then it says, you know, if you go back to the dream, it said that suddenly, out of nowhere, a stone came and strikes the statue at the feet, shattering the entire statue. The pieces are blown away by the wind, leaving only the stone, which becomes a mountain and fills the earth. Now, I don't know about you. <laughs> I love when I'm reading the Bible and there's something surprising that happens. Right? When, when there's like a word that says like suddenly or something. But like this was a surprise. Now it was a dream, but it was a dream that God used to prophesy something. And so it's really important that we catch that. But, but by the way, if you go back, because maybe I made you feel guilty about not liking history, because you apparently are all just like me. But if you go back and actually do some studying into history and you compare the history books and, and Google searches of history to the Bible and all that, you'll be able to, you'll see that all of this all this is the same. Like, it's all confirmed. And so there's no proving anything wrong, 606 B.C., all that stuff. That's all accurate information. It's all history. Um, and so let's go ahead and, and jump to point number three, though, today. What we learned from Daniel 2 is that there is another kingdom that trumps it all. Point number three is that the kingdom of God on earth is the, the kingdom that trumps it all, the kingdom of God on earth. So let's, let's get back to the to the reading real quick, back to verse 34 and continue on reading about the dream. Daniel is, is telling this to King Nebuchadnezzar at this time. He says, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chafe from the summer threshing floors. Then it says, the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found and, that, and, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Listen to me. It says that a wind carried them away. And that reminds me a lot about, uh, whenever I was reading this, I was like, man, a wind reminds me of Acts 2 verses 2 where it says, suddenly... There's that surprise word, right, that makes you kind of get chills whenever you read it. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the houses where they were sitting. That wind, the wind that blew and the shattered pieces was the same wind that came from the breath of God whenever he told the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 37, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come, Breathe from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. Church, you need to realize something. You were created by God and the breath of life that only comes from him is in you. And by the way, when God speaks, things happen. Do you remember in Genesis 1, whenever God spoke and said, let there be light, there was light. When God, whenever God spoke and said, let us make man in our image, and he formed from the dust, a man, and breathed life into him. You know, whenever you speak, what happens? Your breath comes out of you, right? You breathe when you speak. When you speak to the dry bones in your life, when you speak to the dead things that are in your life, you're speaking the very same breath of God that crushed this statue and covered the earth. 
And that's why it's important that we pray first. That's why it's important to remember to pray constantly. That's why our days should start with prayer. You know, when we dream dreams, we should pray that God reveals the meaning. We should pray for wisdom. We should pray protection over the dream or from it. We should pray for for God to be close to us in all of it. And when you pray over and you speak the blessings of God, the promises of God over your dream, over your situation, over your life, there is so much power in that. I'm telling you, there's so much power in that. The passage from Daniel 2, 34 and 35 that we read, (laughs) it explains that the stone that hit the statue, it didn't hit the statue in the chest or the head. I think most of us, if there was a large dude coming at you and you had a brick in your hand, where would you throw that brick? You probably wouldn't try to trip him by hitting his feet, right? You'd probably try to hit him in the head. You remember David was faced with the Goliath, right? And he slung the stone where? To the forehead. Not the feet, because, I mean, what's that going to do? Ow, my pinky toe, you know. That's not going to do anything to most people. It just trip you for a second, he's going to get right back up and come at, come at you again. But there's meaning in this stone being thrown at the feet in this dream. The stone hit the feet and the toes of the statue. Remember what I said earlier, the feet are, is said to be a symbol of the Roman Empire, which was the strongest empire that would be... In, in all of the history books that will tell you that the Roman Empire was so strong, it was the most powerful. And there's a twofold meaning here that I want you to get, that the, the kingdom of God is represented by the stone in the dream, is ushered in at Christ's birth as the Roman Empire ruled the world. At the same time, and the stone strikes the fourth kingdom, which was Rome. I don't believe in coincidences very often, that's got to be a, a, I mean, sometimes, but not in something, something like this. This stone, the other meaning is that the stone also points to Christ coming back to earth a second time to establish what we would call his millennial kingdom, which will crush the governments of mankind as they're allied together, right, in the last days under the, the, the leadership of the person that, w- that we would refer to as the Antichrist, which we'll learn more about at a later time in the series. But as we read Daniel 2, 34, it said, remember it said, the stone fills the earth and overtakes the other kingdoms in the end. The stone of all things, I, I kind of had a hard time grasping this, but it, the stone, which is a lot less value <clears throat> than gold, a lot less value than silver and bronze, the stone overtakes the other kingdoms in the end. It, but the more I thought about it, I kind of, I was thinking, man, what is, what's the significance of a stone? And then I was reminded of what it says in Matthew 21, verses 42. It says, have you never read the scripture, in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Y'all, there's a kingdom that trumps all of the others. It's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God trumps it all. So let's jump back to Daniel for a second and go to to, uh, verse 46 through 48. It says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar threw himself down before Daniel and worshipped him, and he commanded his people to to, uh, offer sacrifices and burn sweet incense before him. And the king said to Daniel, Truly your God is the greatest of gods, the Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this secret And then the king appointed Daniel to a high position and gave him many valuable gifts. He made Daniel ruler over the whole province of Babylon, as well as the chief over all his wise men. So Daniel, in all of this that he went through, was elevated to a place of authority, was elevated to a place of influence and a place of leadership because he prayed first and honored God through his tough situation. Church, I love that we start every year now, for the last three years, this this is our third year, I love that we start every year with the 21 days of prayer and fasting together as a church body. It's a time where we we pray together every day. We have a guide that leads us together. We worship with the same music together. We fast something in our lives together. It's a time of putting God first. It's a time of putting him first corporately and individually Praying first, worship at the first part of our day, or whenever you do it, really, but praying first, worshiping first, sacrificing first, giving the first part 
of your year to God. You know, it really sets the precedence for the whole year. And I want to encourage you, it's not too late to start if you haven't started at all. There's another seven days left. You can jump in right now or just do the, the next 21 days of your life. Give that to God and, and, and follow the guide and, and, and pray and fast something and, and just watch what God does in your life. Um, as you continue to move on in 2023 and dream on and stuff. But as we end every service, I want you to ask this question to yourself real quick. I want you to ask yourself, what now, God? What now, God? Like Daniel, will you take a stand? Will you stay committed to God? You know, David or Daniel stood on his convictions. He walked with courage. He could have easily ran away when he heard the other, the wise men were being killed because they couldn't read Nebuchadnezzar's mind or tell him what his dream was. And as a result, God favored him. God blessed him. Daniel was elevated while living in the middle of a godless culture. Church, I, I want you to, to think about the culture around you right now. Think about the world around you right now. It's not much different. The world right now, we may not call them empires as they did. Some of them we might, but the world is not much different. Yeah, we have more technology. Probably just makes it worse, actually. But the culture around us is shifting constantly and is trying to draw us further and further and further away from God. Y'all, right now, more than ever, we need to pray first. Right now, more than ever, we need to pray first and we need to bring the light into the darkness. We, you know, we're, we're called to make a difference in this world. We're called to engage it, to influence it. And you can't do that just sitting in here and this being the only place that you worship and this being the only place that you pray. You have to bring that to the world. You might be sitting there thinking, all right, so we've talked about Nebuchadnezzar's dream and what that meant. We've talked about how what Daniel had to do with that, what, what was his part in it all. But what do I do with my dreams? What do I do with other people's dreams when they come to me and tell them to me? Listen, I, I want you to dream. I think you deserve to dream, not just that night when you're sleeping, but you should have dreams and visions for your life and for your future. Believe me, I, I, I'll be the first to tell you, one of the most important things that you can do with your dreams and your vision is to write them down. You don't want to forget them. When you write them down, You'll have a chance to pray over them, to anoint them, to bless them. But here's what you ought to do with your dreams when others bring their dreams or when others bring their dreams to you. I'm going to give you seven things that you could write down or you can snap a picture of them from the screen as they come up. But the first thing we've already talked about, the first thing is to pray first. Pray first. That's the answer to it all. The second thing is to process it through God's word. I tell you this, your dream might be from God. Whatever dream you have for your future, whatever dream you have in your life, whatever dream you had last night, it may be from God. There might be a meaning behind it, but it also may not be from God. You know, the Holy Spirit isn't the only spirit, right? You remember when, when Jesus was, on, uh, was being tempted on the mountains by, by the enemy, by Satan, and he told them, this kingdom can be all yours, man. You need to process it through God's word. And then when the door opens, you need to step out in faith. And you might be thinking, it's just a dream. There's no way I could really do that. That's crazy. Listen, it's only faith if it seems impossible to your eyes. If you can see it before it comes, it's not faith. You know, it might seem a little crazy. There's a pastor that I like to listen to that, that has a whole series called Crazy Faith. And he says, he says it like this. Faith is only crazy until it happens. Faith is only crazy until it happens. And, and my wife, Michelle, could tell you an amazing testimony about crazy faith. Even our, 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 uh, the way that we ended from Texas, that we got from Texas to here, uh, to here at ACC, the way that that happened was crazy faith. Number four is be selective of who you talk to about it. Because not everyone needs to know your dreams. And the ones that do, need to be the ones that God has placed in your life that wants the best for you, that wants to support you and will pray for you and encourage you. And then number five, when the time is right, put your whole heart into it. Like it says in Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as you're working for the Lord. 
Number six, don't be discouraged by humble beginnings, distractions, or detractors. And number seven, no matter what happens, don't be defined by it. I'll tell you this, church, and you need to listen carefully. God is the only one who can define you, and he already has. He's called you his children. He's called you loved, cherished, important, wanted, chosen, forgiven, overcomer. He has called you more than a conqueror, accepted, healed, gifted, blessed. And there's more and more and more that he calls you. But I wanted to share something with you that, I, that dawned on me, something that would hopefully uh, that you'd be able to take with you today for your entire year, because this is the third Sunday of 2023. Three, the number three, is, I, was, I was reading through my notes and praying last night and and I started to write this down because it was just mind-blowing to me as God spoke it to me. But the number three is significant because in the Bible, it means, it represents the number of completion and perfection and wholeness. And by the way, you know what happened come February three years ago is when the United States started to hear about this thing called COVID. And then ironically, number three in the NFL, one of the teams, a guy named Hamlin, just a couple weeks ago, was hit hard in the chest. Do you remember hearing about this on the news? And here's where it got emotional for me. He got hit so hard that he, as soon as he got up, you'd see him collapse on the video. And the same NFL leadership, if you want to call them, the same newscasters and and, and publicists and newspapers that would, that would rip to pieces all the people that would kneel to pray or give God glory, they shut up. Not a single person stopped anybody from praying. 2023 is going to be different. 2023 is going to be different. Listen, in this year, go to God, give it to Him, dream big and pray first. This is your year. God is going to reveal something to you. He's going to do something big this year for you and in your life. You know, I started to think about Adam in the book of Genesis when you read through his story. Adam, a lot of people think that he was given control over the, the, the Garden of Eden. He's given control over the animals and stuff to name them and all that, right? But he wasn't given control. He was given authority. And in the same way, you were not given control over your life or your situation or your dreams. You were given authority over them. If you had control over them, you would ruin it right away. I can promise you that. You were given authority, though. You can speak authority with authority. You can speak with authority over your life. You can speak with authority over your dreams, over your purpose, over your giftings, over your calling. So this year, make it different. Go to God first and speak to him with authority. The, the, the authority that he gave you, use that while you pray over your life. Let's stand and worship together. Father, we love you. God, we are so grateful for the dreams that you place within us. God, we know that this year is going to be different. We know that you're going to continue to do big things here at ACC, but God... We know you're going to do things in each and every one of our lives. And Lord, I pray that we are ready for it. Because as you breathe a fresh wind over us, God, we are ready for that revival. We are ready to receive what you are giving to us, God. God, we speak with authority today and we speak with boldness. That the dreams that you have placed within us, the dreams that you have placed in our hearts, we won't run from it. But if it is from you, which will seek you in your word to find out where it's from. But if it is from you, God, those dreams that you have given us, God, we will pursue them with all our heart this year in 2023. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Church, let's worship. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.